Inside the cells of our body, a process we call aerobic cellular respiration uses oxygen to produce ATP molecules, and these ATP molecules are used by our cells as an energy source. Now, what exactly delivers the oxygen to the cells of our body? Well, we have two proteins inside our body that play this role. They deliver oxygen to the cells of our body, and these two proteins are myoglobin and hemoglobin. Myoglobin is a protein that consists of a single polypeptide chain, and it is found in the muscle cells of our body. It is used by our muscle cells to store oxygen and give the muscle cells the oxygen when the concentration of oxygen becomes very, very low. On the other hand, hemoglobin is a protein that consists of four individual polypeptide chains. We have alpha-1 and alpha-2, which are two identical alpha chains, and we have beta-1 and beta-2 subunits, which are also identical subunits. And so these four polypeptide chains give the hemoglobin molecule quaternary structure, and that's exactly what gives that hemoglobin the ability to bind oxygen cooperatively, and we'll see what that means in the next lecture. So what hemoglobin does is it essentially continually delivers the oxygen from the lungs and to the tissues and cells of our body and it also binds CO2 and brings the carbon dioxide back to the lungs so that the carbon dioxide can be expelled by our body. Now in this lecture what I'd like to focus on is how these two proteins actually are capable of binding to oxygen in the first place. So these two proteins contain a special prosthetic group known as the heme group that assists the protein in actually binding the oxygen. And the heme group has the following structure. So the heme group consists of two components. It has the organic component known as protoporphyrin that contains the carbon atoms, the nitrogen atoms, the hydrogen atoms, and the oxygen atoms. And this entire region shown in black is the protoporphyrin. It's the organic component of that heme group. Now at the center of that protoporphyrin is an inorganic atom, a metal atom, the iron atom, and this is what makes up the inorganic component component of that heme group. And it's this Fe atom that is actually responsible to not only binding to the protein, but also to binding to that oxygen, as we'll see in just a moment. Now, notice as shown in this diagram, this Fe atom is bound to four nitrogen atoms. We have one, two, three, four. Now, Fe can have an oxidation state of positive six. And in this particular case, because we have four bonds, what that means is this Fe is in its ferrous state. And what that means is it has a state, an oxidation number of positive two. And so our Fe atom at the center of the heme group can form two other bonds. Now, one of the bond is formed between one of the amino acids of that polypeptide chain. And this is shown in the following diagram. So if we take the heme group and we flip it this way, so if the heme group lies on the plane of the board and we take it and we flip it this way, then at the bottom portion of that heme group, we have an amino acid more specifically we have a histidine amino acid that is part of the protein, either myoglobin or that hemoglobin, that is bound onto that Fe atom. So this purple circle is the Fe atom, the green circle are the nitrogen atoms, the blue circles are the oxygen atoms, and the purple circle is that metal atom, that Fe atom. So on one side of the protoporphyrin plane, the iron atom is bound to the histidine residue of that polypeptide chain. That polypeptide chain can be part of the myoglobin or it can be part of the hemoglobin molecule. So because each polypeptide chain contains a single heme group, myoglobin contains a single heme group, but hemoglobin contains four different heme groups. And that means myoglobin can only bind onto one oxygen while hemoglobin can bind four different oxygen atoms, as we'll see in just a moment. So 
on the bottom of that Fe, we have the bond form between the nitrogen of this histidine residue and this metal atom found in that heme group. Now in this particular state, the electron density around that Fe is simply too large for that Fe to actually fit inside the center of that plane. And that's exactly why this Fe atom will be found slightly below the protoporphyrin plane as shown in the following diagram. So in deoxyhemoglobin or deoxymyoglobin, when the protein is not bound to the oxygen, the iron atom remains unbound to oxygen. And in this case, the Fe metal atom is simply too large. It has too large of an electron density around that protein proton nucleus for that entire metal atom to actually fit snugly in the center of that protoporphyrin. And so what that means is this Fe atom will be found slightly below. Now in this particular case, this Fe atom has one, two, three, four, five bonds. And what that means is it can form one more bond with some other atom. And so on the top portion of that Fe, that is exactly where that bond will be formed between the diatomic oxygen and that metal atom. Remember, it's this metal iron atom of the heme group that binds directly and holds onto that diatomic oxygen. So if this is the unbound state of our protoporphyrin, then when the oxygen actually binds, what happens is this diatomic oxygen oxygen moves from the top position of that Fe and it begins to pull away some of that electron density from that metal atom. Remember, oxygen is the second most electronegative atom on the periodic table and it is much more electronegative than this metal iron atom. And so what that means is the electron density will be pulled away from that metal atom, decreasing the radius and the size of that metal atom. And so what happens is because the size of this iron atom decreases, it now is able to fit at the center of that protoporphyrin group. And so this is what it will look like when it will be bound to that diatomic oxygen. So this is the diatomic oxygen that is bound to this metal atom and it pulls away the electron density, decreasing the size of the metal atom. And now the metal atom is able to fit into the center of that protoporphyrin plane. Now, what exactly is the structure that describes this complex here? Well, this complex between the metal atom and the diatomic oxygen can be described by a resonance stabilized structure as shown on the board. So these are the two electron structures that describe the resonance stabilized complex between our Fe atom and the diatomic oxygen. So on this side, on this electron configuration, we have a dioxygen that contains a neutral charge and we have the iron that contains a positive two, a positive two charge. So it is in its ferrous state. But what happens is because the dioxygen, because the diatomic oxygen consists of these two electronegative atoms, they can pull away an electron readily from that ferrous atom and create a ferric ion that contains a positive three charge. And so one of the electrons will be pulled away from the metal atom and onto the oxygen, giving this diatomic oxygen a negative charge. And this is called a superoxide ion. In fact, this superoxide ferric ion complex is the resonance structure that more closely describes what the structure is between these uh, two atoms, the two oxygen atoms, and this single metal atom. So we see that when the diatomic oxygen binds onto that Fe from the top, that diatomic oxygen develops a negative charge because it is more electronegative and it pulls away those electrons, that electron, from the metal atom. And that's precisely what moves this entire residue up and what allows this metal atom to fit into the center portion of that protoporphyrin group. 
Now, because the diatomic oxygen gains a negative charge, it becomes slightly less stable. And so we have to be able to somehow stabilize this diatomic oxygen inside that heme group. And in fact, what happens is we have another histidine residue that is part of the polypeptide chain inside that protein, either myoglobin or hemoglobin, that binds, creates a hydrogen bond with that negative charge. And this is shown on the in the following diagram. So the actual structure of the iron oxygen complex is resonance stabilized as shown in this diagram. One of it consists of this structure and the other one consists of this structure here. And notice that the superoxide oxygen form has a negative charge on that oxygen and that destabilizes it. And to stabilize this structure, we see that a region of the protein, another histidine amino acid, forms a hydrogen bond with this oxygen as shown in the following diagram. And this residue is known as the distal histidine. So this here is known as the proximal histidine and the proximal histidine is the amino acid of that polypeptide chain that forms a bond with that Fe atom that holds the heme group to that protein. And it's the distal histidine that is found on the opposite side, on the opposite plane of the protoporphyrin that is responsible in forming a hydrogen bond between this oxygen here of this diatomic oxygen and this nitrogen of that histidine and this stabilizes that diatomic oxygen. So we see that if we're talking about myoglobin or hemoglobin, both of these proteins contain a heme group that, are, that is responsible for binding that diatomic oxygen. And it's the iron atom, the metal atom, at the center of that heme group that is actually responsible for directly binding onto that diatomic oxygen. Now, the other side of that iron atom is actually bound onto the amino acid found in that protein. And it's that bond that holds the heme group inside that protein in the first place. We see that we have the distal histidine, which is another amino acid acid found inside that protein that is able to actually interact and stabilize that negative charge on the superoxide ion. And as we'll discuss in a future lecture, it's this stabilization that also allows the unloading, the release of this diatomic oxygen in its dioxygen form to the cells and the tissues of our body.